Hello, welcome. In this module, we are going to discuss cholinergic blockers, cholinergic blocking agents. And I hope you remember the two types of cholinergic receptors, muscarinic and nicotinic. Let me revise for you. Muscarinic contains the heart, the smooth muscles, the exocrine glands, the eye, that you have the sphincter pupil in the eye and the ciliary muscle of the lens and you have muscarinic receptors in the central nervous system. The nicotinic receptors are the skeletal neuromuscular junction, the autonomic ganglia and the adrenal medulla. So when we talk about cholinergic blockers, we are going to have muscarinic blockers and nicotinic blockers. Let's go to the slide. Muscarinic blockers. The first important muscarinic blocker is atropine. And atropine is a plant substance. It has alkaloid. It's obtained from belladonna plant. The meaning of the term belladonna is beautiful lady. Why this name for atropine? The reason is when atropine is instilled into the eye, it produces dilation of pupil. And big pupils, the big eyes, is supposed to be a sign of beauty. So it get, got the name belladonna. So that's atropine. The second one is hyoscine. It's also called scopolamine. It's got more marked central nervous system effects and is useful for motion sickness because it's able to act on the vestibular apparatus. The third group of muscarinic blockers is nothing but the derivatives and the substitutes of atropine which are used in place of atropine for various conditions. So amongst the muscarinic blockers we have atropine, hyoscine and the atropine substitutes. Coming to the nicotinic blockers, you have competitive blockers of the nicotinic receptor site which we call skeletal muscle relaxants an older agent called D-tubocuridine and the newer agents like pancuronium and atracurium. So also in the nicotinic receptors you have ganglionic sites and that's why you have ganglionic blocking agents which will be nicotinic blocking agents. So what we decide to do now is to start discussion of atropine and hyacin and just to highlight the source of the plant, that's the hyoscine and atropine obtained from two plants. Atropa belladonna or deadly nightshade is the plant from which atropine is obtained. It could also be obtained from datura stramonium, that's Jameson weed or Jameson weed. Sacred datura or thorn apple are more names. Scopolamine or hyoscine occurs in hyoscyamus niger or henbane. Now we go to the discussion of atropine as anti-muscarinic drug. It's a competitive or surmountable blocker. I hope you remember competitive antagonism from your general pharmacology module. Acetylcholine is the agonist at this receptor and atropine is an antagonist. We're talking about the muscarinic receptor, heart, smooth muscle, exocrine glands, eye and central nervous system. So atropine is going to block these muscarinic receptors. So I'm calling it a competitive blocker or surmountable blocker. It blocks only the muscarinic receptor sites, not the nicotinic receptors. And it is not selective within the muscarinic receptor sites. Muscarinic receptor sites are further classified into M1, M2, M3, M4, so on and so forth. But atropine does not select between M1 or M2 or M3 or M4. It acts on all the muscarinic sites. So, while describing the mechanism of action, I am saying it is non-selective between the muscarinic receptor sites. Now we go to understand the actions of atropine, which I have displayed on this particular slide. The first action is on the heart. It decreases the vagal tone. Please remember it is going to have opposite effect of acetylcholine. So, it will decrease the vagal tone and that's why there will be mild increase in the rate of the heart in the sinoatrial conduction and it will prevent the vagal bradycardia. The AV conduction is also going to increase. Going to the next line, talking about smooth muscles, is going to have opposite effect. Acetylcholine contracted the smooth muscles. Atropine is going to relax the smooth muscles and this is often called antispasmodic effect. The third site in our muscarinic sites was exocrine glands. You know acetylcholine is needed for the exocrine secretions. Atropine is an antagonist, so all the secretions are going to be decreased. The next site is the sphincter pupillae in the eye. And because acetylcholine contracts this muscle, 
atropine is supposed to paralyze this muscle. Let's, let's have a picture, let's have a diagram and understand what are the intrinsic muscles in the iris. I'm drawing the iris now. The aperture in the iris is called pupil. This is going to be the pupil. And the iris is this area. It's composed of two muscles. The first muscle is the radial muscle of iris. And it has this direction of the fibers from inside out. That's the radial muscle. This radial muscle of iris is also called dilator pupillae and it's under sympathetic control. So I'll put it here as sympathetic. What we're talking about on this module is atropine. And atropine acts on the muscarinic site. What is this muscarinic site? The muscarinic site is the sphincter pupillae. So I'm drawing the sphincter pupillae in this blue color. Yes. Do you see my hand rotating? Like a circle. So it's called circular muscle of iris. So that's the circular muscle of iris. Or it's also called sphincter pupillae. What's the way this sphincter muscle of iris contracts? If you add acetylcholine to this muscle, this sphincter muscle of iris is going to contract like this. So the contraction is like this. So it's going to produce constriction of pupil or meiosis. So it's also called the constrictor pupillae. This is the muscarinic site on which atropine is supposed to act. This muscle can contract only in this direction. Now what's going to happen is, you're going to add atropine on this particular muscle, this particular muscarinic receptor. And when atropine is added, because it's a muscarinic antagonist, is going to paralyze this muscle. The sphincter pupillae is paralyzed. And when the sphincter pupil is paralyzed, it's not going to produce any change in the size of the pupil. It's just going to remain a lax muscle. But this muscle is under parasympathetic control, cholinergic control. And the other muscle, radial muscle of iris, is under sympathetic control. So you can understand both of them are sitting in the eye and they are working together. And when the radial muscle of iris, which is under sympathetic control, understands that the circular muscle of iris is paralyzed, is lax, the radial muscle of iris is a sympathetic muscle, it starts its own activity. And the radial muscle of iris starts contracting on its own. So it contracts in this direction and then it's going to contract in this direction is going to produce dilation of pupil. So you are going to have metriasis. And that's the mechanism by which atropine produces metriasis. Please mind well, atropine is not acting on the radial muscle of iris. It has acted on the sphincter muscle. And the radial muscle of iris has, has dilated the pupil on its own. It's not the action of atropine. It's not an active phenomenon. The radial muscle of iris went into activity on its own and this is why this dilation of pupil is called passive metriasis. Let me have some space here to write. That's called passive metriasis. So we say atropine produces passive metriasis. Let me remind you of the sympathetic drugs who acted on the radial muscle of iris because there was alpha 1 receptor there and they contracted the muscle so this particular metriasis was active whereas when atropine is acting it is acting on the sphincter pupillae it's not touching the radial muscle of iris this dilation of pupil is brought upon by the radial muscle on its own so it's called passive metriasis so we say atropine produces passive metriasis let's have a look at the slide. So in the eye, it paralyzes the sphincter pupillae and the dilated pupillae goes into overactivity as we just described and this leads to passive metriasis, so this dilation of pupil. The second muscle in the eye is the ciliary muscle of the lens. Here also you have a muscarinic site. 
So atropine blocks the ciliary muscle of the lens and it leads to what is called cycloplegia, is paralysis of the ciliary muscle of lens. And that's why there's inability to accommodate for near vision. Because the ciliary muscle of the lens is paralyzed, the lens is going to fall forwards. Because the sphincter pupillae is paralyzed, it's going to fall and it's going to crowd in the anterior chamber. This leads to increase in the intraocular pressure, the intraocular tension. So atropine produces three effects, number one, passimetriasis, number two, cycloplegia, and number three, increase in the intraocular pressure. The last action of atropine is in the CNS, and in the central nervous system is able to decrease the tremors and able to decrease the rigidity because these effects could be the effects of acetylcholine, the central effects of acetylcholine. So also, atropine in the central nervous system can produce CNS stimulation and disorientation. Let's come to the adverse effects of atropine. The first adverse effect if the patient is going to suffer from is dryness of mouth because it's going to decrease the secretions. The second line is telling you that's blurring of vision and photophobia. The lens is going to be fixed, it cannot accommodate and the pupil will be dilated and it will be fixed. If light comes on this particular pupil, this pupil cannot constrict because atropine has paralyzed the constrictor pupillae and that's why the pupil will be wide open and it will be dilated. Naturally, the patient cannot tolerate the light and is tempted to close his eyes. So we are calling it as photophobia. So the patient would get blurriness of vision, photophobia and increased intraocular tension. The third thing which would happen is due to the relaxing effect in the smooth muscle of urinary tract and that's the retention of urine and urgency. The fourth one is obviously going to happen is decrease in all the secretions. So as you have dryness of mouth, you will have dryness of the respiratory secretions. And what I've done on this slide is I have written X, X, this red one telling you that please don't use this drug in chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. It's going to be contraindicated and it's due to the dryness of secretions. And this could add to the discomfort of the patient who is already breathless. So also you will have dryness of the secretions in the eye. In the gastrointestinal tract is going to produce constipation because there is a relaxing effect on the gastrointestinal tract. As far as the heart is concerned, it's going to lead to mild increase in the heart rate. So that's called tachycardia. If atropine is taken in a large dose, that's the overdose of what you call poisoning, then you are going to get decrease in the thermoregulatory sweating. It's going to lead to hyperpyrexia. This patient will have elevated body temperature. They'll be flushing. And as I said, it stimulates the CNS of it and produces disorientation. So there could be confusion, excitement, agitation, delirium, disorientation, and finally coma. What I want you to remember is the diagnosis of atropine poisoning, two important things, hyperpyrexia and coma. Hyperpyrexia and coma if you think of these two things coming together, don't forget about atropine. Let's come to the therapeutic uses of atropine. Number one is used as pre-anesthetic medication in the dose of 0.6 mg intramuscular or intravenous. Why we prefer atropine as a pre-anesthetic medication? Number one is going to prevent the vagal bradycardia and cardiac arrest. So you don't have a fear of the stoppage of the heart. Number two, it's going to decrease the secretions and it's going to relax the smooth muscles. Number three, it's going to prevent the cough, vomiting and the laryngospasm. So there are three reasons we prefer atropine as pre-anesthetic medication. If you have seen a lecture on the cholinesterase, anti cholinesterase agents, I hope you would remember atropine is the drug of choice to treat organophosphorus compound poisoning and it's two to three milligrams intravenous to start with. Next, you can also treat early mushroom poisoning with the help of atropine and you can treat all the overdoses by various anticholinesterase agents, not only organophosphorus compounds, but also with physostigmine. I am reminding you, physostigmine crosses blood-brain barrier and atropine also crosses blood-brain barrier. That's a very important issue. So if you have a physostigmine overdose, you could use atropine for the management. If you have atropine overdose, you could use physostigmine to manage this overdose. The next important use of atropine 
comes into action when the patient is coming with AV block and digitalis induced bradycardia. AV block and digitalis induced bradycardia because atropin is going to block the mascarinic receptors in the heart. It could be used with pyridostigmine or neostigmine in myasthenia to block the muscarinic actions and it is an important antispasmodic in all types of colicky pain as well as the pain due to peptic ulcer. You could think of using it for mediastinal cycloplegia. You could also use it in Parkinsonism to block the excess of acetylcholine.